Okay, excellent. On this National Day celebration, uh, we have, as I said, four more speakers. Um, the, the next speaker is a good old friend, Stephen Joseph Ngatunga. Um, we have come across uh, for, for quite some time, uh, uh, first in Tanzania, then you have worked for the Eastern African Freight Forward Association, and then now you are uh, for FIATA, for the Global Freight Forward Association, in charge of the region of Africa and, and Middle East. So we welcome uh, Stefan, please. Right. Thank you so much. My name is Stephen Joseph Ngatunga. I'm a Tanzanian from Tanzania based in Dar es Salaam. Um, it's about my titles. Uh, it's about my titles. Um, the president for Tanzania Freight Forwarders Association, as well as a president for Federation of East African Freight Forwarders Associations. And also I'm the chairman for the Africa and Middle East and FIATA, that called IRAME. Um, so about uh, FIATA, first of all, I would like to talk about FIATA. FIATA is an apex board of the freight forwarders in the world, which is based in Zurich, Switzerland. And FIATA is divided this world into four zones. There is a zone of America, zone of uh, Europe, zone of uh, Africa and Middle East, zone of Asia and Pacific, that is all countries in Far East. So each and every zone, there is a chairman who is leading and taking affairs for the freight logistics in that region. So um, last year, I was appointed to be a chairman of the Africa and Middle East, as well as the president of FEAFA. The outline that I'm going to talk about is about uh, overview of FEAFA, uh, stock taking, challenges, opportunities, and key milestone by FEAFA. Amen. I'll go through, no problem. Thank you so much. FIAFA, FIAFA is a regional private sector um, association for the customs clearing and freight forwarding industry in the region. And this was formed in uh, 2006, uh, registered in Tanzania, and also the, the, I mean, the secretariat based in Nairobi. Uh, Nairobi, um, the members of the FIAFA is the national association from across East Africa member states. Um, uh, which uh, we represent about uh, uh, 2,500 farms. Vision of the FIAFA. FIAFA, an, an efficiency, professional, and competitive East Africa uh, freight logistics industry, and the mission is to promote professional freight logistics industry for the trade facilitation and regional economic growth. The mandate of FIAFA is improving business environment through advocacy, enhancement, enhancing professionalism of the industry through training and self-regulation, uh, by providing business intelligence. So if I speak about the professionalization of the industry in the region, FIAFA in collaboration with the East Africa Customs Directorate and the Revenue Authorities has managed to have the curriculum for the per curriculum and training materials to train the freight forwarders in the region. So we are issuing the certificate which is called EACFFPC, East African Customs and Freight Forwarders uh, Practitioners Certificate. So whoever obtaining this certificate he is eligible to work in all country member states of East Africa. Status on e-commerce. On FIAFA. Improve, uh, improved legal environment development and improvement of the business support um, infrastructure, development of, um, development of e-business initiatives by the government, e.g. single window, online clearance of goods through customs and ports, 
also uh, increased use of the e-payment system, also risk management. For example, we're using ECTS, um, ECTS, electronic scanning. So ECTS is an electronic cargo tracking system. As you, the previous presenter talked about the main ports that we're having in East Africa, that is Mombasa and Dar es Salaam port, which is serving the landlinked countries. So for the transit cargo, which is cleared in these ports, they are fitted with a gadget called the electronic cargo tracking system, and it is monitored through the custom service center for, from both Mombasa and Dar es Salaam. So wherever cargo goes through, it is well monitored. So there is no diversion of cargo within until it crosses border to the final destination. So there is electronic uh, tracking by the service providers. Most of the, uh, most of the truck, uh, truck owners, they've got, own their, they've got their own system of tracking the cargo. Also, there is paperless transaction, electronic submission of the document to the government, electronic cargo uh, clearance, electronic booking of space with the shipping lines, airlines, and the trackers. Also in this, there is a way on how you can track your cargo uh, in the ship. If the ship is coming from, let's say, from Italy, you, you can just track it online and see where the ship is in Salala, or it is in Mombasa, or wherever, coming to the destination where uh, the port of destination. Also, we have the e-learning, um, online trade information portal, regional online platform for practitioners uh, and the service, uh, service provider. And, and the plan is underway to provide a um, mobile application for the industry. Some other challenges, um, infrastructure limitation, quality, avail quality availability, and liability. It, for, for example, there is low and uh, unreliable internet co coverage low and unreliable power supply. This is one of the main problems, and sometimes we are, having, we are having system down. So once the system is down, so the, 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 uh, how to lodge the documents and to practice in e-commerce, e, e it's becoming difficult. But we believe that the government will work hard to make sure that these things are going well. Also, there is a slow of immigration of the e-business by the government. You know, sometimes the governments are very slow in implementing this thing depending on the budget, and mostly they, they are depending from the donor funds to support in order to get these things going. But we always encouraging our government to make sure that they are aligned in the needs of the world today. Also, we have some recommendation for the legal and environment and providing improvement, improving support infrastructure, migration to the e, e, e business by the government. So, of course, we have said that there are some uh, clearance by the uh, using the e-commerce or electronically, we submit document to the custom system and the uh, port, but sometimes they do inquire the physical documents. However, we have put them into the system but still they request it from the agents to submit the manual documents. So this also the government should look upon. If we are embarking in the e-commerce, e e we must go totally for it and trust that all the documents are clear and correct. Um, FIAFA initiatives in the training. So as I said earlier that we have developed the materials, curriculum and the materials that we are uh, training our people for the sense of professionalization of the industry. So here we, are, we have the, some of the manuals, we have the, we have the class training, and we have the e-learning uh, e as well. Also, FIAFA has developed the um, code of conduct, standard training condition, and the regi uh, registration and uh, certification also self-regulation. So in part of the FIAFA, we talk about FIAFA because we are talking in East Africa, but basing to the uh, FIATA, as I'm a chairman of the regional Africa Middle East, also now we are, we, we are the plan is underway to establish a federation in, in Central Africa, especially for the Francophone countries, so that they can also go through 
this, uh, this type of initiatives that you have taken in East Africa to make sure that we professionalize the industry in this part of Africa, then we go to West Africa, as well as in Middle East. Thank you so much. Thank you very, very much, uh, Stefan. Um, no, your, your very constructive and concrete suggestion remind me of a discussion I once had with uh, the Fiat is it Director General, Secretary General, uh, Sangaletti at that time, I was uh, teasing him saying, actually, Fiat and the freight force, you should not be in favor of trade facilitation because the more complicated trade becomes, the more we need you, you know, to, to help us overcome it. But, but you have shown, and, and it's not just the lip survey, I mean, what you are doing in this region and the programs you have shared, it's not that you want to keep the share of the cake for the freight force. You want that the cake gets bigger. And I think that's, that's really uh, appreciated. Our, our next uh, speaker is um, Nancy Amunga, uh, Chief Executive, CEO of Dana Communications Limited. And as we have Nancy here, uh, we have one little parenthesis here, uh, because you're also an Anktat Alibaba Business School e-founder fellow. Yeah? And we are very proud that you are one of, one of ours. And I think there are a few of your fellow fellows still in the room in spite of the national holidays. And I had warned you, I will make you stand, you stand up, please. So the e-founders in the room, please stand up who is still in the room. You have to stand up to be a good example. And there are one or two others in the room, you were, we were told, or are they all gone? They are all gone because I promised Arlette to make them stand up. Uh, okay, so Nancy represents the, the e-founders, and I wanted to give them applause, but yes, we, uh, we give an extra applause on behalf of all the, the e-founders, and, and the e-founders uh, are here, actually, but yes, it's true, they had this other meeting um, where uh, they meet regularly in room six in this compound and are happy to network with especially the logistics people. I think uh, we had already introduced. So room six, there will always be some e-founders happy to connect. But now I give the floor to Nancy to share a private sector perspective on e-commerce and logistics. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Nancy Amunga. I am the founder of uh, Dana Courier Services. We provide last mile delivery in Kenya, and we've been doing the business for the last five years. And as the moderator mentioned, I am an e-founder. This is a partnership program between Alibaba and Anktad, where young qualified individuals go to China for two weeks to train. Um, these individuals are people who are in the e-commerce space, and um, this is a great platform uh, for them to learn from the gurus network and as well as get exposure. So I will give my perspective as a young person doing business and in the e-commerce e -commerce space and also, you know, like from a private sector perspective. So I believe the internet has really changed over the years and as a result, um, as a, as a result of, of increased internet use in business, market giants such as Amazon and Alibaba emerged. These giant stores now trade in almost, um, you know, like all the parts of the world. These, compan these companies are enjoying global markets because of internet, and that's why it's important for us as Africans to ask ourselves, are we really taking advantage of the internet? Of the internet? What is the status uh, of rising global e-potential in Africa? It is estimated that 32% of Africa population is connected to the internet. Majority are not. That is why we need to do more to make sure the number increases. By we, I mean, you know, like this should be an initiative uh, by both the government and the private sector. In short, I'm saying, I'm talking about the players with common interest in the e-commerce space. While only a third of African population has access to internet, the ongoing 
uh, revolution of e-commerce has increased market access to products from Africa. We can now access markets in China, India, Europe, but it has also increased competition for upcoming businesses, not only from their neighbors in Africa, but also from other countries in other regions. You know, like, um, the Chinese business mogul, Jack Ma, says that when he started his business, he knew that the internet is going to be big, but he didn't imagine the internet is going to be as big as it is right now. And I think Africa should not be left behind in, the 21st, in this 21st trade revolution. Uh, but before Africa can realize its potential provided by global internet platform, it must address the challenges facing e-commerce. I believe some of the challenges uh, to e-commerce in Africa is mistrust to online shopping. And this I'm talking from experience because at times when we deliver items, the clients are like, I have to pay on delivery because I don't trust if I give my money, the items will be delivered. And on the other hand, the person selling online, they don't know who the client is and if the client is genuine. So there's still a lot of mistrust. And I think um, what the government can do is maybe to come up with a policy to protect both the sellers and the buyers. And I also think uh, another challenge is fragmented market because of many tribes, different cultures and different politics. And um, also people prefer to pay in cash. I think in Africa we still believe that money is money when you can see it. I was in Hangzhou in, um, you know, in China and it's a cashless city. But I still think in Africa we have this tendency of I have to see it. It has to be money, I have to see it for it to be called cash. And um, I'll give an example. There's a guy who went to the ATM and withdrew all the money from his account and took it back to the teller inside, stating that he doesn't want all the money to be stolen from outside, yeah? So, yeah, I think there is, you know, like still that issue of hard cash. And then delivery logistics. I'm glad that this has really been mentioned uh, by the previous speakers. The issue of the public address system. Many a times when you want to deliver, even here in Nairobi, you'll find that from the CBD to maybe an estate, because nowadays so many people, we do last mile delivery, so which means we deliver to people in their homes. And at times when you want to deliver, this person does not know how to give you direction to their own home. So you find that a rider will waste a lot of time on the road trying to locate where this person is. So we've come up with a um, creative way of trying to solve this by using the POI. This is the point of interest. So if your home or your office, uh, there are some offices which we still can't locate. If your home or office is close to a mall, we use that as the point of interest. But at times you find that someone will tell you a mall that's very far. So by the time again, the rider calls to get to their location is really, you know, like um, a problem. And then another problem is internet connectivity. Like I said earlier, it's only a third of Africans who are connected to the internet and e-commerce is equal to internet. There's no e-commerce without internet. And I think in countries like maybe Zambia or Uganda, the internet is not affordable. And I think um, there are some governments, I don't know like if maybe this is a very new thing and we have to give them time, like maybe Uganda, where guys are being taxed to use social media. So which means you can't trade online if you're being taxed to even use the social media. Um, so that, that discovery or realization is important in addressing the e-commerce challenges as it requires joint effort of public and private sector to develop international e-commerce in Africa. Technology is an equalizer. So I believe as Africans, we really don't have, you know, like uh, an excuse because instead of you know, thinking of how you're going to import your stuff from Africa, why don't you also, I mean, from places like China, why don't you also think about how you're going to penetrate their market and maybe sell to the one over one billion people? So in my closing, these are my suggestions and solutions to, you know, like the challenges mentioned. I think consumer education is very important because for me, I still have family members who don't believe you can buy online. 
and the item will be delivered to you. So I think consumer education, um, cross-border uh, cross markets, and I am so glad that in Africa we signed the treaty of, you know, like we are trying to make Africa as a free movement region, which is going to promote trade. And then technology sharing, and this really came out, um, you know, like uh, in the, in the, with the other panels where we, we don't really share data. And for us to move, I think we have to share data. Uh, enterprise capacity building, uh, institutional capacity building, digital payments. I know we have um, solutions like M-Pesa who are doing so well, but I think we can always do more. And the internet penetration, If even in Kenya, like if you go to other cities or counties like you know like Pokot there is no internet at all so for us to really take advantage of you know like this e-commerce I think the government and the private sector can work to make sure that there's no there's more internet um, penetration and access and then I think this is you know like we all have to work together we cannot leave it to the government alone and we cannot leave it to the private sector alone. So I think working with policymakers and stakeholders, and I'm glad we have such forums where we all come together and converse and try to find solutions to the problems. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, uh, Nancy. Very proud to have you as our UNCTAD uh, entrepreneur. Uh, yeah, several of the challenges you mentioned are not necessarily just logistics, but it just showed again how all this is very much interlinked. You need an address to actually uh, deliver physically. You need to pay. Uh, you need the internet. And then you as a private sector uh, are still in it, still working on it. And uh, yeah, we are very optimistic that with people like you, we will move forward. Uh, and we will move forward also with Alban Odiambo, <laughs> the Regional Director for Trade Markets Africa, ICT for Trade and Transport Facilitation Program. Um, Alban has worked over 15 years in designing, developing, implementing information-based products in transport and logistics. And I, I want to highlight also here what we spoke with uh, Everist. Uh, success, of course, always has many parents, no? and all the good things we have done together with trademark UNCTAD and the EAC. Of course, we are all three very proud of it. <laughs> um, and I think Everest gave some numbers. There have been real hard KPIs, and I guess you will also share some of these. And, and uh, again, we have, I think it's a very good tripartite partnership we have, we have with largely your funding and your support on the ground, your offices, the political vision of EAC, and then UNCTAD work on customs, on trade portals, on corridors, on TFC. So I'm just again uh, claiming some of the credit as well for this collaboration. But now, Alban, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much, Jens. Uh, good evening, everyone. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And as Jens has said, um, it's a privilege for us in Trademark to actually have this kind of partnerships uh, with UNCTAD and many organizations in Eastern Africa to actually work on issues to do with uh, trade and uh, trade, trade and transport facilitation. So um, the work we do as an organization really is to enhance trade in Eastern Africa to try and help all category of traders to, to actually move goods across borders more efficiently, more predictably, more reliably, and, and actually to fulfill their aspirations to actually uh, grow economically and also socially. Uh, so that's the key thing we do in, in, in organization. And uh, we do a lot of other things um, that are related to that. We do hardware, so we do things to do with physical infrastructure. We do a lot of work on around issues to do with standards and uh, quality of, of goods. Uh, how do we work with private sector, particularly SMEs, to actually enhance the quality of the products they are producing and put them out there to market access to those markets, so address some of those challenges are there, that are there. Uh, the, pro the program that I oversee in Trademark actually then looks at how do we use ICT to actually enhance uh, trade by looking at the entire value chain and all the actors in that value chain, starting from the person producing the goods, 
up to the person who is consuming those goods and all the intermediaries. Uh, so I'll just focus on actually trying to paint a picture of what we aspire for for this region. Uh, and I'll start by actually painting the dream and we think this dream is real. Um, uh, just to give an anecdote to that is uh, way back, I think it was in 2003, 2004, um, my mom lived in, the, my grandmother lived in the village and uh, I used to, as a good grandson, send him, send her money. And um, the only way you could send money was through postal services. That's the best you would do. And so I would send money today and she would get the money probably a week, a week and a half later. And she would have probably to walk probably about 10 kilometers to the post office to collect the money. Uh, so emergencies would come, and you can imagine how challenging those would be. Of course, uh, she had a mobile phone, and that was way back in 2004, and one of the conversations I had with her was, well, if you work on this thing called the internet, I'd educated a little bit on that, why don't you send me money through this phone? Uh, and of course, it's just amazing that a few years after that, mobile money begins to work in Kenya and changes all that and it makes life much easier. So we in Trademark, this is the dream we have for, for this region. And the dream is something like this, that I'm walking in the streets and I'm seeing someone either carrying a handbag or a pair of shoes and I ask them, okay, where did you buy this? I, it's really nice, I want it. And they tell me, well, I bought it in Kampala. And I said, okay, fine, it's nice. I probably take a photo of it. She or he is wearing them. I take a photo of it. I go online when I get home, and actually I get it online, and actually I buy it. And probably three or four days later, I have it. That's one scenario we look at. Of course, for that to happen, there is an entire infrastructure, an entire logistical framework that actually enables this to happen. There's an entire marketplace that is so dynamic that makes this happen, and it's possible to happen. It's not happening yet here, but it can happen. Another one that we look at is rural areas. So let's imagine the worst rural areas we have, uh, particularly when the issue of addressing has been mentioned here a lot. So let's talk about pastoralists, people who actually don't have exact physical locations throughout the year where they stay. Uh, they move based on weather patterns, where there's rain, whether there's, where there are resources, that's where they move. So why don't we have a future where a pastoralist boy can actually go online and buy something and DHL will deliver it, regardless of where they are at that particular season? Uh, and I think we can be able to do this. It's possible. And I think the entire innovative infrastructure of ICT that currently is there can do this. It's possible for us to do this. Even with the limitation we have of connectivity of internet, there are alternatives. And I think if we put our heads together, this can happen. So that's the future we look at uh, in terms of what we think. Because if it works for all Africans, anywhere, any place, whether you're in a rural area, in a slum in Nairobi, in an upmarket place in, uh, in Kampala, it, it, it's, we can do it, we can make it happen. So behind this, our thinking is this, that we need for this region to actually set up a digital backbone, a public infrastructure that is cross-border, that will enable flow of information, seamless flow of information across borders, and also enable flow of financial services across borders. There's a lot of limitation around that. I think it has been mentioned. Uh, E-commerce companies face a lot of problems on uh, cross-border payments, particularly when the sums of volumes are small or values are small. So create that seamless process and then have all this integrated layer of logistic service providers, uh, for example, like Dana, who then can move the goods physically and efficiently across borders. Now, that's the backbone we want to create. That's the partnership we want to form with entities and organizations and develop. And we want to do it based on the work we have done a lot with some of the agencies we've worked. A lot of the work we've done in the region mainly has focused on working with regulators, so customs, uh, 
uh, standards organization, SPS organizations, and all agencies that are involved in regulating the movement of goods across borders. Uh, and now we want to move into the private sector space. So how do we work with organizations, companies that are selling, and how do we use the internet for them to expand that reach of their market across this region? And it is possible, as I said, even in places where there's low connectivity or challenges of connectivity. Because if we wait for connectivity to get to rural Africa, we will wait for a long, long time. And people don't have that time. Uh, our citizens don't have that time. So I think we have a responsibility to actually make this happen in the shortest time possible. So in, in our aspirations and our desires on organization, this is an infrastructure we are looking at that should be set up probably in the next three to four years. Probably we'll start in bits and do proof of concepts on how it works, and we actually see then how we build it. Our belief is if this huge infrastructure or backbone is created, all people who are offering e-commerce services, regardless of whether it's a marketplace, whether it's a logistic service provider, whether it's somebody who wants to buy, package, and resell, or whatever model of business they want, and they plug into this infrastructure, it will eliminate so many of the challenges we have on e-commerce. So mention the issue about trust. So if you have a backbone where the core players in it is customs, for example, and customs says anyone who is plugged into this backbone, that they will trust or they will facilitate that person to move good, then you remove the issue about trust. So trust, people then overcome trust because they know, for example, if I use this supply chain and it is integrated in this platform, if my fulfillment, the promise of the product I bought is not fulfilled, there's the ability for me to get a refund and the supplier has the ability of him, the backward process can work, that now the good can actually be returned and I can actually get my refund because I didn't get the fulfillment of what I thought I would get online. Uh, so that's the kind of infrastructure that we think will enable this region to actually leapfrog and our thinking is it will not be an infrastructure or a backbone that is purely based on internet. It has to be based on other alternatives, particularly mobile alternatives, because that's the only way we'll be able to reach, probably build an infrastructure that is inclusive in the current state of affairs in, uh, in, in Africa. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Alban. V very interesting. and. Uh, yeah, the, the move to, to mobile. We all remember the leapfrogging when countries had a very weak telephone network and just leapfrogged to the mobile telephones. And I think that is in the direction you are suggesting, I believe, you know, for many of the electronic. And, and the good thing is it's not just that you have highlighted what could and should be done, but actually with Trademark, you do have some of the means. Uh, the, you have the human, re you have brains, you have institutional, you have funding, so we, we are very optimistic. <laughs> uh, last but not least, um, and really not least, uh, we, we agreed and I apologize that I put Juliet last. Somebody has to be last, but Juliet um, uh, working on innovation and solutions development at Kentrade will, will um, be the sherry on the cake with some life, we, and we, we tested it out, it should work, live uh, sharing with you uh, the really good solution that uh, we again developed together <laughs> uh, on, on uh, a trade information portal. Um, um, Juliet has an MBA in, in business and Bachelor in Science, so cross-section of business and IT, just the right uh, to give her a welcome applause for her concluding presentation. Good evening. I'm delighted to be here this afternoon to share with you uh, the move Kenya is taking in streamlining international trade procedures. Kenya is an important hub for the East African community, serving landlocked ESC partner states such as Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi, and Southern Sudan. The government of Kenya has therefore been at the forefront in streamlining international trade procedures through the national single window system, also known as the Kenya Trade Net System. As the usage of the single window system increases, there is evidence of an information gap in import, export, and transit processes necess necessitating online publishing of international trade procedures. Hence, 
Kenya has implemented the Information for Trade in Kenya portal, which was launched in November 2017, thanks to USAID, Trademark East Africa, ITC, and UNCTAD. The trade portal, together with the single window system, provides an end-to-end -end solution on regulatory and documentation requirements in the country. With this trade information readily available through clear instructions on how to export and import, traders find it easier and quicker to be compliant and discharge their formalities with fewer time-consuming interactions. The core of the InfoTrade Kenya portal is a comprehensive database on foreign trade procedures. Currently, the portal has published import, export, and transit uh, procedures for over 50 commodities with documentation of more commodities ongoing. The information on the portal is presented step by step as seen from the point of view of the user and not from the view of the regulatory agencies, policymakers, and umbrella bodies. A request to do a quick illustration on how a trader navigates through the portal when accessing information on how to import or export a particular commodity and also so show the key features of the portal. And I beg to see it so that I can easily navigate. So a trader wishing to import export or transit a commodity from Kenya, will click, will access the InfoTrade Kenya portal and click on the type of operation that is import, export or transit against the commodity they wish to, to import, ex export or transit and then click the search button. For this case, we'll choose uh, to export uh, one of our major export commodities which is fruits and vegetables. Upon searching, the system will show the preliminary registrations, licenses, and certificates required, the necessary permits, and these are per consignment, and the clearance process. The system also shows the full procedure view, and this is for a first-time trader or for any, anybody who may want to see the end-to-end -end process. Upon clicking, uh, I will illustrate with the full procedure view so that you can be able to see the end-to-end -end process of exporting fruits and vegetables from Kenya through Jomo Kenyatta International Airport. At a glance, the trader will be able to see that it takes 45 steps for them to export fruits and vegetables from Kenya through Jomo Kenyatta International Airport. And here, a step is every necessary interaction with a government officer, any other stakeholder like a bank, or an online system. We see that we have some milestones that the trader needs to achieve. The first milestone, milestone being to obtain an export license. And within the milestone, the trader will be required to go through four steps. The second is obtain farm inspection report. The third is to obtain a pack house inspection report, etc. On my right, the trader will see a summary of the procedure showing the other institutions involved in exporting fruits and vegetables uh, from Kenya through JKIA. And at a glance, they can see that we have nine different institutions involved. And at, on, over each institution, we have some numbers in orange, and these are the numbers at which uh, the institution is going to be engaged by the steps. For instance, in step one, to submit an application for export license, uh, AFA Horticultural Crops Directorate is going to be engaged by the trader. The trader will also see the results of this, uh, this procedure to export fruits and vegetables, and these are the total results that he shall obtain from the steps. And you see that this procedure to export fruits and vegetables has eight different results. Then we have the required documents. The trader is required to submit 36 different documents to the various institutions. And we can see the steps at which these documents are required. For instance, the certificate of incorporation is required at step 11, step 19, and step 38. The trader will also see the, a summary, um, an estimated cost of the procedure 
This cost is, uh, is a breakdown of the fixed and the variable costs. Some of the, some of the costs can be computed. For instance, it takes Kenya shillings, uh, uh, sorry, uh, 58.4 per kilometer. So if a trader's farm is uh, 100 kilometers away, they can be able to compute how much it, it will cost them, uh, to, to, to how much it will cost them uh, to export fruits and vegetables. These costs are variable and some are fixed. The system also shows the total duration uh, of, of, of the procedure, and this is uh, divided into waiting time in queue, attention at the counter, and waiting time between the next step. For this particular procedure, we see that it takes at least 27 days for the trader to export fruits and vegetables and 84 days at most. This 27 days is when the trader has fully complied with all the regulations and when also the government agencies are philanthropic enough to approve uh, all the necessary documentations. 84 days is when there is an event, the system was down or there were other delays. The system also shows the total number of laws that govern this particular procedure. We can also look at a step. We say that a step is every necessary interaction with a government officer, a system, or any other stakeholder like a bank. Within a step, we have the contact details. For instance, to submit an application for export license, a trader will be expected to go to AFA, Horticultural Crops Directorate, and the unit in charge is Regulations and Compliance Department. The person in charge is David McCory. And the contacts are detailed at the bottom. We also have the regional offices attached for the traders who may not be within the headquarters. At the end of the step to submit application for export license, the trader will receive a tracking number that he shall use to track uh, his documentation. Then we have the requirements for this step. We have a total of nine requirements and two extra for exporters buying produces from farmers. Some farmers are exporters, but you have some brokers or some other middlemen who may uh, be wanting to export. So there are some documents that are required from them. That is a PS2 form and a contract. This step takes a minimum of 10 minutes to 30 minutes in queue. Attention at the counter is the, time, the, the, uh, is the time that it takes for the trader to be served. It takes a minimum of five minutes to 10 minutes. Wait, waiting time till the next step is seven days to 15 days. And we have all the legal justification that justifies this particular step. We also have additional information. And this is any necessary information that could not be accommodated in any other place within the, the interface. We have uh, the certification of this particular procedure. This information has not just been collected and documented, but has been certified by the process owners. Then we have some two very important and key features. A feature to report incorrect information. In the event that a trader visits an agency or any other stakeholder whose procedure is documented, and sees anything that is incorrect and does not match with what that you've described within the procedure, then they can report. For instance, they can see that uh, or find out that the fees are different or the time it takes is different, then they can correct that. So then we can pick it up with the agency. Uh, a trader also has a, a, a facility to suggest simplification there are situations where traders can suggest ways in which we can simplify a procedure, and we've given them that feature. At the bottom, we have a recourse where a trader can report in the event that uh, they are dissatisfied with the services that they are given at that particular institution, then they can report to the particular office, which is Regulatory and Compliance Department, and they'll find or the report will go to the person in charge who is Josephine Simiu. On my left, I see that we have some steps with some orange bullets, meaning that this step can be completed online. And the step without an orange bullet is a step that is physical, meaning a trader has to literally visit that office to obtain that particular service. So the trade portal has enabled Kenya uh, comply with Article 1.2 of the WTO Trade Facilitation Agreement and also has made Kenya competitive globally. To the traders, with the information at hand, 
they can easily plan for various logistical issues and including resource allocation and budgeting. They also enjoy transparency in trade rules and procedures. Traders uh, are also improving their compliance levels since they understand all their legal obligations. And to the regulatory agencies, they are benefiting since the silo working has been minimized and therefore there is promotion of harmony through the trade information portal, encouraging regulators to view the process from end to end, look at the entire value chain and not from the interventions that they offer to the traders. And this, in essence, enables, enables them to understand that their input, their interventions, or any delay within the process affects the entire process. There is reduction at crowding in government offices, e.g. in search of trade information, because this information is available online. And one of the most important benefits uh, that has been realized or that is going to be realized with this trade portal is that it's enabling regulators, policymakers, and other stakeholders to easily identify complexities and redundancies in various procedures and therefore detect simplification opportunities. And that's the next step for Kenya. We have documented over 50 commodities, uh, the, the, the imp import, export, and transit procedures. The next step is to look at those procedures and see how we can simplify them, how we can harmonize them. And this is going to be led by our policymakers and the National Trade Facilitation Committee, who are going to form some working groups to look, critically look at the procedures with the aim of simplifying them. Uh, mainly, the simplification of trade procedures includes looking at the steps critically and requirements and removing the unnecessary steps and any redundant requirements. In Kenya, we've begun with the export of coffee from, from Kenya, and uh, currently we've managed to eliminate the number of steps. We have 90 steps currently, and we've managed to propose elimination of the steps from 70, from 90, sorry, to 79, and the number of required documents from 77 to 68. Uh, as I conclude, I want to state that trade procedures are necessary, but it is not necessary that they are complex. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Juliet. I think uh, I trust you all agree there was a nice concluding live uh, example. And uh, I, I want to underline what you also highlighted. This tool that we all developed together here has really two main purposes. The first one is the, the product itself. It helps you to be compliant. You make trade more transparent. And, and in itself, it's a good product. But for us, the agencies, Trademark, EAC, UNCTAD, ITC, for us, it also helps us, the second point you made, we then simplify, we, we improve, we identify what um, you really need, 87 steps and so and so many documents. And what we will launch tomorrow at the ministerial will be a comparison where not all of this will be actually public because the countries may not necessarily want all this to be public, but if I have a table of the five countries next to each other, for this identical process, country A needs 78 steps and the other one needs maybe really only 15, this is very motivating. So for me, that is one key message I would like all of you to take, take home. There, there's really a practical solution. And the second one is to make this work. I mean, we, you have seen the photos. We all now have a photo of Josephine Simiu. No? <laughs> you remember, we saw Josephine's photo. Uh, imagine in your agency, be it agency or private sector, somebody comes in with a big camera and says, can I please take a photo of Josephine <laughs> and uh, uh, publish it on the web? So uh, for this to work, and I remember the process, you needed the political buy-in. And there we work very closely in the different countries with the NTFCs, because it's not just customs, all many different agencies. So I see this really as a package, and that's also in our phase two project, the trade portals and the simplification that need to be done afterwards, the, the other point I made earlier. If we really want to simplify afterwards for trade, including e-commerce, you, the technology, fine. We have, we have the photo of Josephine, that's fine. <laughs> but we actually need then, we need to get into the room to take the photo, and then we need to get out and 
simplify. That, so I abused my position as moderator to eat up the very last minute we had and tell you we have no time for questions. Uh, I, I want to thank the interpreters. Un grand merci. Il y avait plusieurs collègues francophones. To thank uh, the interpreters. For your, your patience staying on until the end for the cherry of, on the cake uh, on the national holiday. And I wish you all a very good evening. Hope you are all have a good evening. See you tomorrow. Thank you all very much and the panelists. <laughs>